Hey there, students. We are live and we are ready to begin our A Push Corona class for Thursday. Sorry, we're starting a little bit late today, having to get all the streams set up and everything. But generally, we are expecting the Corona class sessions for A Push to happen at 1 p.m. Eastern on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Okay, so hello, Sarah. Hello, Charlotte. Remember that those of you watching on YouTube, you are welcome to join us on Crowdcast. Um, that it's, you know, if you go to HTTP, Crowdcast, oh, I, yeah, we're on, we're on YouTube, okay, so, slash Tom Ritchie, you will be able to find this uh, in Crowdcast, where I'm doing most of the interaction. I am going to be checking the YouTube chat, but be sure to join us on Crowdcast, where I've got uh, a little bit more of an interactive setup and a way to ask questions, okay? So as far as that goes, let's go ahead and focus our questions on the progressive era, okay? Now, after today's broadcast, we're going to take a step back, okay? I'm not really going to do any dedicated 20th century review beyond the progressive era. Because as we look at this here, Lily, you were asking me a question about, do I think the DBQ will be about American imperialism and the Spanish-American War? I do not, because that was the DBQ two years ago. So here's what we're looking at when we go into the 20th century, okay? So the 20th century, we're looking at, we had a progressive era DBQ last year, an imperialism DBQ two years ago. So that early 20th century has been kind of saturated. Now, also, I don't think that we're going to see the Depression. I don't think we're going to see World War II. Um, hey there, McKenna, good to see you. Um, because I think that when we look at the Depression and World War II, um, that our issue is that a lot of classes didn't get that far. So what I'm thinking, now I want to go into the Progressive Era for some context. I think it's important to have some knowledge of this period. But every review you I'm going to do that's dedicated to a time period from here on out is going to focus on things that are in the 19th century, okay? And then a bit of American Revolution review, early national America. But I'm going to focus a lot of my reviews on the 20th century. So no, I do not believe the DBQ will be on imperialism in the Spanish-American War. That one we can pretty much eliminate because that specific topic's very recent. Um, the Progressive Era was done last year. And then the 20th century, uh, when we get past the Progressive Era, I don't think that that's going to be it. Now, it could be wrong. We want to make sure that we don't even ignore that stuff. But I do think since a lot of classes, a significant number, I would say at least a third of A-push classes did not get to the depression in World War II. I think that, you know, we're going to see, we're going to see that. So can I explain the creation of the bull moose slash progressive party, not just the ideology after Teddy Roosevelt lost the election. Now, technically, Angela, the bull moose party was created before and, you know, during the election, you know, before the election of 1912. This was an election where, you know, Teddy Roosevelt did a third party. OK, so did a third party. And as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, that's a third party run. Let's go ahead and take a look at the election of uh, excellent, excellent. So uh, Donald, at some point, maybe so. I don't think that I'm going to be getting into American imperialism in this particular series, but at some point, certainly. All right. So glad to see people uh, watching from the UK and internationally. And so with that 1912 presidential election. So let's go ahead and take a look at the 1912 United States presidential election and kind of go over the dynamics. OK, so let's see what is it that we see in the creation of the Bull Moose Party, OK, or the Progressive Party, as we might call it. So let's go ahead and put uh, this screen focused. All right. So when we look here, basically what happened here, this is we've got some other elections like that where the 1856 election is another example of this. OK, so the 1856 presidential election, what we see happen, this is kind of a trend in U.S. history when we see that James Buchanan, the Democrat, uh, is running against uh, John C. Fremont, the Republican. 
Republican and Millard Fillmore of the Know Nothing Party. Now, the Republicans and the Know Nothings were both trying to fill the void, okay, trying to fill the void left by the Whig Party, okay? So the 1852 election was the last election that the Whig Party participated in, okay? So 1852, after that, the Whig Party is done. And so with that, we've got these two parties trying to fill the void. Now note here that the Republicans, as far as the popular vote, okay, the Republicans get, uh, uh, I've got a new mouse with a very sensitive scrolling apparatus. So the Democrats only got 45% of the popular vote. Um, the Republicans getting a third of popular votes, the know nothings getting about a fifth. Okay. So the Democrats only, um, you know, only got 45% of the vote, but they won because their opponents were divided. And when we see here what's going on here, that of course the Democratic Party in the 1850s was largely based in the South. So you see essentially um, besides Maryland, uh, which ironically was originally a Catholic colony, right? Um, that as far as uh, as far as that goes, uh, Maryland was originally a Catholic colony, but the majority uh, voted for Millard Fillmore, the plurality or whatever you see in Maryland of the Know Nothing Party, which remember was a party that opposed Catholic uh, immigration. Um, so as far as that uh, as far as that goes. Um, we've got that. Now you see that all of the slave states besides Maryland, all of the slave states besides Maryland are voting um, for the Democrats. And then you look at the slave states plus, minus Maryland plus one, two, three, four, five free states. Okay. So only five free states supported the Democrats. But you note here that the slave states plus five free states equals the presidency in 1856, okay? So what's going on here in 1856 is a classic example of the principle that, you know, when one, part, the party that is more united tends to win the election, okay? Tends to win the election. And so going from, going from there, we see 1856. Now, 1912, you see here that essentially now you've got Eugene Debs of the Socialist Party getting about 6% of the vote. Uh, and then you've got Woodrow Wilson, the Democrat, with 41% of the vote, okay? So Woodrow Wilson is going into the presidency with only 41% of the popular vote. When you look at this, just like in 1856, Roosevelt and Taft together got more votes than got more votes than um, Wilson. But the thing is that they are their votes are watered down, and so Wilson was able to get a plurality in more states. Okay, so you see that Teddy Roosevelt in green here, the progressive candidate, won several states. Uh, you know, one, two, three, four five, six, and then the Republicans getting two states, but the Democrats being united were able to get more votes because their opponents are divided. Remember in a presidential election, a candidate does not have to get a majority in order to get those votes. So when we look at this election, uh, we see here, if we can look at it, we don't see anything in this article by state, okay? But it's but it's pretty interesting looking uh, looking at this. So what's happening, okay? It, oh, actually, we can see here. So for example, um, if we look at a state like you know, so uh, wow, so that's one thing in California. We see that that was only by like about two hundred votes, okay? So we see here that Roosevelt got less than 200 votes more than Wilson and carried California. Um, so then you see here where in Connecticut, Wilson got 39% of the vote, then we see 17 and 35. And so, you know, Taft got almost as many votes as Wilson, as Wilson, but Roosevelt's eating into this. So what's going on here during the progressive era? Now, there are some interesting arguments that can be made here because Taft in some ways was more progressive than Roosevelt, okay? When you look at Roosevelt gets this reputation as a 
trust buster. Okay. So Roosevelt gets a reputation as a trust buster. Um, so going from there, uh, going from there, we think about this Roosevelt, uh, never, uh, you know, Roosevelt never went in and challenge standard oil for example okay so standard oil is uh you know is something that you know roosevelt never went after them now roosevelt did go after the northern securities commission so if we want to look at teddy roosevelt as a trust buster if we want to look at teddy roosevelt's uh, trust busting apparatus you know the sherman antitrust act now remember that you know the sherman antitrust act is what was there for roosevelt and taft so we do want to note that the sherman act was a little bit limited in what you could do okay so the trust had to be so flagrant that you could go after them now roosevelt if we're looking for an example of roosevelt trust busting okay so the northern securities case so if you want to see now remember you want to have an idea and then you go for the specifics so if you want to think about was teddy roosevelt a trust buster well he went after northern securities basically the great northern railroad and the northern pacific railroad companies created a basically a trust and created a monopoly in the northwest okay so there's a monopoly on railroad transportation in the northwest so going from there a dog with no teeth are we talking about uh what are we now that's uh you know if you can clarify that for me um vicky that's going to be very helpful to me so it's oh yeah you're talking about the sherman act i believe okay so basically northern securities you've got the great northern railroad the northern pacific railroad and that created essentially a monopoly and so teddy roosevelt went after this monopoly note this is a five to four case so there were four justices who actually saw Decided, uh, you know, we've got four justices who sided with Northern Securities, and that would be interesting to look at. But we want to note that Teddy Roosevelt went after this railroad monopoly, but he never went after Standard Oil. It was Taft who went after Standard Oil and broke them up. OK, so Taft, Standard Oil. OK, so when we think about Taft and Standard Oil. That's what's going on there. So the Taft administration, actually, you know, what you see here is the Supreme Court um, ordered the breakup of the Standard Oil Company. OK, so basically the Standard Oil Company of New Jersey guilty of monopolizing the petroleum industry. OK, now this was uh, looks like this was a much closer, but or may, I mean, much more decisive vote. There's only actually one concur dissent. Okay, so this we see here the Sherman Antitrust Act was used by Taft. Now, Teddy Roosevelt, though, as far as Teddy Roosevelt was concerned, after he left the presidency, Teddy Roosevelt became more progressive in his thinking. OK, so as far as that goes, yes. Uh, and it's great to have some teachers in here watching with us, uh, with us as well, contributing. And so with that, the Clayton Antitrust Act, um, you know, as Miss Skinner says, it put teeth into the dog. So we do want to acknowledge that Teddy Roosevelt and William Howard Taft were operating under the Sherman Act. But we also want to note that there are some cases where Taft was more progressive than Roosevelt. But Roosevelt, besides, many of y'all have seen Austin Powers. Some of y'all have, some of y'all haven't. A lot of the kids may not have, but you're not progressive enough. Uh, you know, that is, uh, you know, that's, and, and I love you too, Vicki, uh, and all of the teachers who are supporting my work. But, uh, you know, we think about Dr. Evil, Teddy Roosevelt's like, you're not progressive enough. Um, and so, you know, for Teddy Roosevelt, 1912, he concludes that William Howard Taft is too conservative. And what we want to understand here, I'm going to use an AP government term when we think about political polarization. OK, so when we think about political polarization, uh, you know, so just one second. OK, so as far as that, uh, you know, political polarization, um, we want to think about in terms of today, like Republicans tend to be conservative 
Democrats tend to be liberal to progressive, right? So, and then a lot of people who are more moderate, they tend to kind of be maybe independent, leaning one way or the other. But this is not how politics worked in the progressive era, that each party had a conservative and a progressive faction. And so what's happening here is that Teddy Roosevelt saying, look, I want to run on a purely progressive ticket. That's where Teddy Roosevelt during the 1912 campaign was campaigning for the direct election of senators. Okay, so Teddy Roosevelt wanted, uh, you know, a lot of things to happen that, you know, William Howard Taft wasn't necessarily advocating for. So Teddy Roosevelt wanted, you know, a new apparatus uh, in order to be able to bring about more progressive reform. And so from there, we're going to uh, we're going to get into that. So basically, the Bull Moose Progressive Party kind of ceases to exist after the 1912 election. It does not compete in the 1916 election. So in the 1916 election, we see that that Woodrow Wilson uh, is uh, you know is running against a Republican and uh, you know wins the election with uh, you know with about 49.2 percent of the popular vote versus the Democrats 46. So Okay, so Wilson wins on this slogan. Remember, in 1916, he kept us out of war. Okay, that was Wilson's slogan in 1916. All right. So um, Raul, when we think about, okay, now the Bur oh, the conservation movement, okay, I was thinking about the conservative movement. And Raul, I think I might have an email from you I need to get back to. Uh, you know, I think from the title, I I've just been slammed this week, um, that we're doing a push on Tuesdays and Thursdays at 1 p.m. Eastern, and then government on Fridays at 1 p.m. Eastern. So Corona class every day, 1 p.m. Eastern. Um, so with that, uh, the birth of the conservation movement. So when we think about about this during the Gilded Age, like one of the questions that I put forward in our last broadcast uh, was, you know, when we think about the Gilded Age as laissez-faire, oftentimes the Gilded Age is characterized as laissez-faire. Now, in some ways, you could argue that this is a, well, fair characterization, but in other ways, not. Okay. So when we think about conservation during the Gilded Age, um, the government basically allowed companies to go in and take resources out of the earth, cut down as many trees as you want. You know, the paper companies can come in there. They can cut down trees. They don't have to replant. They don't have to be responsible for the environment. So in that sense, we would see how during the Gilded Age uh, that in terms of conservation, the government was laissez-faire because we really didn't see policies from the government that were aimed at, we need to have some kind, you know, let's think about the buffalo, let's protect the buffalo herds, let's create some national parks, let's make sure that when paper companies are cutting down forests, that they have to replant and rotate those forests. So when we look at that, that, you know, if we're making an argument, was that, you know, was the Gilded Age laissez-faire, uh, then, you know, in that sense, yes. So when we think about conservation, that remember the progressive era, we put things under this wider umbrella of government regulation of business and an expansion of the government's role in the economy. OK, so we see as an expansion of the government's role in the economy. So going from there, when you think about the conservation efforts that Teddy Roosevelt is saying that, you know, it is the federal government's responsibility to make sure that we have sustainable practices. OK, now the thing is, what we have to make sure about is that Teddy Roosevelt's a conservationist. Now, you've got this guy, um, Murr or Mir, M-U-I-R, I don't know, it's a written or a type test or whatever it is this year. So when we look at this guy, um, you know, Murr, he was a preservationist. Now, preservationists wanted to take like, you know, just whatever's going on uh, right now in nature, keep it as it is. Now, Teddy Roosevelt was a conservationist. There are so many cool photos of Teddy Roosevelt, uh, you know, Teddy Roosevelt's big game hunter. Okay, so if we're looking at this, uh, there are so many, oh my goodness, does this really say all 512 animals Teddy Roosevelt and his son killed on safari, okay? Um, that is, it looks like we've actually got, uh, you know, that. so basically Teddy Roosevelt was an avid hunter, looks like he personally killed 
512. Okay, so nine, okay, so when we look at this, let me give y'all a link here. Uh, this is, uh, so a link here, when we think about, okay, mayor, very good. Okay, so so with that, um, you know, I see here that Teddy Roosevelt killed nine lions, his son Kermit, eight lions. Kermit killed three leopards and seven cheetahs. Teddy Roosevelt had none there. Now, Teddy Roosevelt shot 15 zebras to Kermit's four. So they basically went through here and they try, they, they basically made a list of all of the animals that they shot together. Teddy Roosevelt killed 296 animals, including a crocodile. His son killed three crocodiles. Um, Teddy Roosevelt shot looks like two ostriches, uh, a pelican. Okay. I mean, this is really uh, impressive and there should be at least one elephant here. I don't see where the, uh, wow, they've got the gazelles, the big gazelles um, in three different uh, subspecies, it looks like. Now, I don't see, let's see, so a wildebeest. I mean, they just went through and were just shooting and shoot. Wow. Teddy, okay, this is actually a little bit, okay, this is a little bit sad now that I look at this a little more, uh, that we see, uh, we see, let's see, um, I saw, gosh, giraffes, okay, seven hippos, um, then we've got eight rhinoceroses or rhinoceri and eight, 11 elephants between the two of them. So, you know, my point being that they, they should, yeah, it, it's like at first it's like, okay, I did fine. Yeah. Thanks Vicky. And the, you know, so you see here at first, it's like, wow, they shot a lot of animals. And then it's like, Oh, they shot a lot of animals. Okay. They shot a lot of animals and, you know, so, so it's a little bit, but one thing I want to note here is that here's a guy that's just like you put him in uh you know in the middle of africa with a shotgun and this guy is just a you know uh, an animal okay but at the same time here's the thing because teddy roosevelt likes to shoot animals so wild animals so much he wants not only his son but what about his grandson and his great grandson, he wants them to be able to shoot wild animals as well. And that's when we think about conservation versus preservation. Okay. So we're thinking about preservation. That's where we have things like a wildlife habit habitat where you're not able to do any hunting or anything like that. This is a wildlife preserve. Okay. So then when we think about conservation, like, you know, I know people who are into, um, into deer hunting, for example, and there are uh, limits on how many deer you can kill in a season. You buy tags. And the reason for that is that hunters tend to be very much conservationist in their mindset. They don't want somebody going in and killing so many wild animals that the next season there aren't going to be any to kill. So that's the thing when we start thinking about this. Yeah. So when we look at exactly, Lily, that preservationists want to preserve nature with, you know, from, you know, they want to protect it from humans. Conservationists just want to make sure that there's some left later on. So for example, conservation, that's why you know, I tend to, you know, when students are like asking me if I've got a recycling box for paper, I'm like, you do understand that paper is a renewable resource and paper companies are required to rotate their forests. OK, now, of course, uh, you know, we can look at toilet paper is scarce right now and paper towels and that sort of thing. But as far as that goes, uh, let's see, is Vinny one of yours, Vicky? <laughs> All right. So uh, so with that. When we're, when we're getting into, now I read an interesting article just out of, you know, like let's run this like a class. I get on all kinds of tangents in my classroom. Uh, any of my actual students will tell you, but the toilet, the toilet paper thing, a lot of people chalk that up to panic buying, but here's the thing, the companies that make toilet paper and paper towels, they are divided into residential and industrial. And so what's happened here is with the quarantine, we have, we see a spike in residential demand because people are spending more time at home. So it's not that the paper is scarce. It's that it's just they're, they're used to a certain amount of demand and they're having to justify with the demand going more home and less about the, uh, you know, about less about the 
oh, I see, they're messing with you. Uh, less about the businesses, like the demand, certainly schools aren't needing to buy any, you know, the schools are large consumers of paper products, not right now. And so with that, that is the difference between conservation and preservation. And neither one of these was happening during the Gilded Age. So as far as that uh, goes, thank you, Theo. And as, as, long, as far as that one goes, uh, we are getting into um, this characterization. Now, remember that the characterization of the um, Gilded Age uh, as laissez-faire, in some ways, it lives up to that characterization, and in some ways, it does not. So that's why I don't like to refer to the Gilded Age as laissez-faire, because when I look at the Gilded Age, I see lots of government interference in the economy. It's just that the interference is always pro-business. Remember that the government's response to the Pullman strike, that was not laissez-faire at all, okay? There's nothing laissez-faire about the government's response to the Pullman strike. And speaking of the Pullman strike, so when it comes down to it, the government's response to the Pullman strike um, is, the government's response to the Pullman strike is that we are going to put Eugene Debs in jail. We're going to, uh, you know, we're going to bring in the military if we have to. We're going to do whatever we have to do to side with uh, to side against the strikers and to get the economy back up and running because the Pullman rail car company is covered by interstate commerce because they deliver when rail cars deliver the mail. So what's happened during the Gilded Age is when there's a strike, then what we see is the government is intervening against the strikers. Whereas when we look at during the progressive era, so let's go into, uh, you know, first of all, when we think about Roosevelt, the anthracite coal strike of 1902. Now you notice here that what I'm doing here in terms of, you know, when we're thinking about what is it that you need to know, you need to have a general trend. You need to know a general trend and then you need to have a piece of specific evidence to support that general trend. So when we look at the anthracite coal strike, for example, of 1902, this is a little bit different. And what we see here, there is a new sheriff in town. I tell you what, Teddy Roosevelt probably would have loved to have been called sheriff. Um, it, he just seems like that type of guy. And so with that, uh, you know, just, uh, you know, when you go to the images, Miss Skinner students, uh, you know, she now this this is one of my favorites. We've got a meme here with Teddy Roosevelt uh, having hunted a triceratops. Um, but you see there, there are tons of pictures of Teddy Roosevelt and his son. There's Teddy Roosevelt um, with one of the rhinoceros, you know, with the rhinoceros that he's killed there with one of several elephants. Um, so, so with that, the coal strike of 1902. What Teddy Roosevelt did here was that uh, Teddy Roosevelt invited everyone to the White House. Okay, so he invited leaders of the strikers and leader of leaders of the business. Okay, so when we see here Roosevelt, uh, you know Teddy Roosevelt, uh, you know he says here that we want to investigate the strike, and so what he's what he's saying here is that uh, you know, what he wants to do is he wanted to intervene. Now he's told he has no authority to intervene here, but he, in but he eventually convened a conference of representatives of government, labor and management. So instead of intervening in the strike, uh, Teddy Roosevelt is saying like, look, we're going to, uh, you know, we're going to go into this and we're going to say here that we need to sit down and talk about it. So that's now, this also goes back to the idea of Roosevelt's square deal. So when we think about the substance of Teddy Roosevelt's square deal, which we can see exhibited in the, uh, you know, in the anthracite coal strike, the square deal is about the government is no longer going to take the side of business all the time and of the vested interest that Teddy Roosevelt is saying that the government's role, and this is where, you know, we get into, yeah, really, Benny, uh, you're going to have to go back. You're going to need a time machine, I believe. But uh, here's the thing that we want to think about, that Teddy Roosevelt is promising that everyone's going to get a fair shake with him as president, that the government isn't just going to be siding with one side 
all the time, okay? And, and this is where Richard Hofstetter uh, wrote a book called The American Political Tradition, which I used to assign to my APUSH students, but I find that this, re that this redesigned exam doesn't do a lot to reward like very in-depth knowledge. Um, so, you know, when we, you know, but in this book, he's got, uh, you know, this chapter called Teddy Roosevelt, the conservative as progressive. So we want to note here that while Teddy Roosevelt um, is a progressive president, um, he's not like full on progressive, okay, that, uh, you know, that there definitely are some things here about his square deal where he's trying to be fair. And we also look, we see the square deal when we look at his trust busting. Teddy Roosevelt believes that if businesses, if there's a monopoly out there, for example, let's think about this. Now, we can call Standard Oil anti-competitive all we want. But at the same time, one of the reasons that Standard Oil was anti-competitive is that Standard Oil put out oil that was cheaper and better than what other people were doing. So when we think about Rockefeller being anti-competitive, part of the reason Rockefeller was anti-competitive is because Standard Oil was putting out good oil and they were doing it cheap. And so when we think about that, the Standard Oil, now also when you look at the Gilded Age and we look at those, uh, those strikes, Standard Oil did not have strikes during the Gilded Age. Generally, Standard Oil employees were paid above what other companies' employees were making. So John D. Rockefeller, one thing that we need to understand is he created this super efficient company uh, where, you know, he's not only able to pay his workers fairly, but he is also able to, you know, in addition to paying his workers fairly, he's able to get oil out there at a good price and the oil is quality oil. So when you look at this from Teddy Roosevelt's perspective, the mere existence of a trust does not threaten the public interest. It is when a trust begins to use that advantage. Like, you know, John D. Rockefeller and Standard Oil, we would call this a natural monopoly because John D. Rockefeller didn't build his monopoly by getting government favors. He built his monopoly by out-competing uh, you know, competitor after competitor. And so the thing is now, of course, William Howard Taft, we could say that that was influenced by Ida Tarbell, okay? Ida Tarbell, who was a muckraker. We do want to understand muckraking in the context of the progressive era. When we think about muckraking, it's these journalists who print these sensational stories uh, that uh, that prompt people to think like, you know what, uh, this, uh, this sensational story here, um, this is something that uh, is making me rethink. So when Ida Tarbell publishes her scathing history of the Standard Oil Company, public opinion suddenly shifts against Rockefeller and Standard Oil. And that's part of the reason why you see Taft going after Standard Oil because of this, uh, this shift in public opinion due to muckraking. And that's another thing if we think about the 17th Amendment, the direct election of senators. That was because of a muckraking series published in, wait for it, Cosmopolitan Magazine. Now, Cosmopolitan Magazine today is one of those magazines that, you know, in the grocery store, they've got like a little thing in front of it so that young people are not reading things on that magazine that are inappropriate. So Cosmopolitan Magazine or Cosmo, I don't see that as much in grocery stores anymore. Um, so as far as that goes, though, that and it may be that I'm just not looking behind uh, the right thing, but basically... The cover has, you know, typically a really beautiful woman on there, uh, you know, dressed uh, scantily or suggestively and having all kinds of like attention grabbing headlines. Now, at the, at, the, at the time, Cosmopolitan was a general interest magazine. OK, it was basically a general interest, general readership, current issues kind of magazine. And, uh, you know, so it had this series called The Treason of the Senate. OK, and the treason of the Senate, uh, this series is basically going in and making the Senate look like a corrupt and fraudulent institution. 
And so going from uh, going from there, um, where you see this uh, muck raking, you see that that's going to result in a policy change. Okay, we see the 17th Amendment was a result of muckraking. So that's something that is important when we're looking at what's going on here during the progressive era and the influence of muckraking. Okay. So we want to, we want to note that that is, uh, that that is happening. Okay. So muckraking, we're thinking about out of tarble with standard oil, um, Jacob Reese, how the other half lives. Okay. So as far as that, uh, as far as that goes, Jacob Reese, um, in how the other half lives. Um, this is an 1890s. He's kind of the godfather of muckraking. He was going after the tenements. Now, you don't need to know who all the muckrakers are, but I would pick three muckrakers to learn well. Like, so for example, uh, Ida Tarbell, Jacob Reese, and of course, Upton Sinclair, the writer of The Jungle. Now, Upton Sinclair is an interesting case because The Jungle was actually a work of fiction and Upton Sinclair was a, uh, you know, was a socialist. And what he was trying to do, the whole point of The Jungle, that Upton Sinclair was hoping that there would be sympathy for immigrant workers, okay? There'd be sympathy for immigrant workers. Um, there would be, uh, you know, sympathy for, you know, people would say, you know, we don't like these conditions that immigrant workers are living and working in. Now, people read this book and they're like, are the meat processing plants really that nasty? And so there was a congressional investigation um, into this that we want to investigate the meatpacking industry and, you know, which uh, is getting some attention today because you're having coronavirus outbreaks. Make sure that, you know, I need to, after I'm done here, I need to run to the store and buy some more meat, put it in the freezer um, because we could be getting into a situation where, you know, we've got uh, uh, some brief interruptions in our meat supply. I don't know. I mean, I don't mean to get all like uh, alarmist here, but, but I do have, you know, I am, you know, when I go to the store, I'll buy, you know, a couple of things, you know, a couple of packs of meat, whether I need them or not. Um, and then I'll put them in, I'll put them in the freezer. And so that way, if we do have a temporary uh, suspension, you know, a temporary crisis in the availability of meat, then we'll know. OK, so as far as that, yeah, we are getting some things here. So, you know, we could be I mean, definitely we're seeing the meat packing plants in the. <laughs> oh, Caroline, <laughs> you've got jokes. I tell you, that's a knee slapper right there. I could just go vegan and then I wouldn't need meat. OK, um, so. Uh, so. Yeah. All right. But uh, but thank you, Caroline, for your contribution. Uh, you know, your uh, your advice has been has been noted, uh, you know, kind of like so. Uh, so with that. Yeah. So, Dale, exactly. When we're getting into uh, we're getting into Upton Sinclair, I aimed for the public's heart um, and, uh, you know, and I hit the public's stomach. OK, which here again, like one thing that's very interesting um, as we get into like, for example, Example, a po like President Trump has like signed some kind of executive order limiting immigration for the next 60 days. Now, from what I can tell, the actual executive order doesn't do much to limit immigration at all. It's largely symbolic. Um, but but the thing is, there are some people that have called this un-American. And when you look at this, when have Americans ever really had sympathy for immigrant populations. So that's one thing like this evening, I'm actually going to be on the Bill of Rights Institute's YouTube channel. Um, we're going to be, so this is a good segue to talk about this at 6.30 p.m. Eastern. Okay, so youtube.com, uh, let's see, Bill of, you know, let's see, uh, let me just put a link to the Bill of Rights Institute's YouTube channel. OK, so the Bill of Rights Institute's YouTube channel, I'm going to be on there at 6.30 p.m. Eastern. And what I'm going to be doing at 6.30 p.m. Eastern is I'm going to be um, I'm going to be talking about immigration and internal migrations in U.S. history. So y'all want to subscribe to the Bill of Rights Institute so y'all see when I'm going live 
for that broadcast. Okay, so we're going to be getting into immigration and internal migrations. And when it comes down to it, that when you look at Upton Sinclair, it's like, oh, let's see if Americans are going to be sympathetic to immigrant poverty and the squalid conditions that they're living in. And it ended up the American public was not. But it's like, hey, we need to do something about the meat. So Congress passes the Meat Inspection Act which basically allows federal inspectors to go into meat processing plants, which meat processing plants at the time uh, were involved in a lot, you know, which today even are involved in interstate commerce. So remember that Chicago was really a central location. Um, when we think about the Chicago Bulls, for example, thank you, Sarah, the Chicago Bulls, why are they called the Chicago Bulls? Well, Chicago was a meat packing center. Um, for the entire, you know, for most of the country. They, you know, meat went far and wide from there in refrigerated cars. Also, when you think about the Haymarket affair in Chicago, why Haymarket? Well, Chicago is the meatpacking center. So that's why there would be a Haymarket. And so when you look at that, you see that meatpacking is interstate commerce and the government is going in and that's a regulation of business. That if I own a meatpacking plant, Federal inspectors can show up unannounced and they can take a look at the conditions in my meatpacking plant. And if they're not meeting inspection, I can be shut down. So that's something that we see that the government, whereas they may have been a bit laissez-faire when it comes to regulating business during the Gilded Age, um, during the progressive era, the government is not shy about regulating business. And so another thing here is when you look, another thing we see in the news now, we, we I mean, so much is being kind of reenacted in front of us. Uh, we see that the FDA, the FDA, I believe, has very recently um, come in and approved an at-home test for the coronavirus. Because you can see like right now, um, what we see with, uh, you know, with corona, the biggest problem is we don't know who has it. We don't know who's had it because we don't have testing. We don't have information out there. So the FDA has approved an at-home coronavirus test from what I can see. So the Food and Drug Administration, before the FDA, you had all these like, you know, call them like snake oil salesmen and stuff like that. You could just go around, you could stamp something on something and say it cures what ails you and you sell it. Uh, you know, so here's the snake oil. It's supposed to be good for you. Now, you'll notice on products today that they claim to be good for you. They're noting that the, the claims here have not been medically evaluated. Okay. So that's something that is important that the claims here have not been medically evaluated. So when it comes down to it, the Food and Drug Administration. So for example, when you look at labels on your food, that the FDA mandates that there be labels on the food, that they meet certain criteria. I think also what's interesting is, do you notice that the labels, they're always black? I think that that's regulated as well. Um, that, you know, when I see like a bag of chips that's got the label, there's no black on there and they had to pay extra money to print in black. Uh, this is because of a government regulation. Hey, Devin, good to see you here. And so that is the biggest thing about the progressive era is that we have the government's willingness to be more active in the realm of business and to regulate business. So with that, I don't mind this being a little bit of a shorter broadcast here. Um, we will, uh, if anybody's got any other questions, go ahead and ask. Um, we are going, what do y'all think about for next week? Okay, because remember, I want to take a step back. This is going to be probably my last dedicated broadcast on the 20th century, okay? Because I really think that it's unlikely that the 20th century is going to be on the exam uh, for the reasons I've already gone into. Two recent DBQs in the early 20th century, a lot of people um, going, you know, in the mid 20th century, uh, you know, not, uh, you know, not getting that far in class. So Jefferson, so something like, you know, Jefferson and Jackson. Now it's going to say right now that there is not go. Okay. So, so we see here. Okay. I think that we've got some good things here. Jefferson. So, so I'm going to be uh, populating the class. Okay. So for example, let me note here that we have one, two, three, four, we have six Corona classes left. Okay. So we have six Corona classes left uh, and um, I will be, so we've got six Corona classes left. 
I will be titling those. Those are going to take place at 1 p.m. Eastern on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Okay, 1 p.m. Eastern on Tuesdays and Thursdays. There will be six more of them. And I will take y'all's advice into consideration as I begin titling those broadcasts. So remember, 1 p.m. on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And remember to tune in to the Bill of Rights Institute. Okay, tune into the Bill of Rights Institute this evening. Okay, on uh you know, on that. Okay. So with that, now let me see here, Angela, I'm going to answer this question real quick here. How much effect did mil Now, if you're saying military campaigning, one thing that we want to note here, uh, that, uh, that what happened between the wars, if we want to understand why Americans were, uh, you know, so uh, against getting involved in World War II, that Congress issued the Nye Report in the 1930s. And the Nye Report, uh, the Nye Report concluded that the reason that we got involved in World War I, involvement that by the 1930s, most Americans thought had been a useless waste of 100,000 American lives. And the Nye Report, this congressional report, concluded that the, the reason why we were drawn into World War One is because of the armaments industry. And that's why when you look at the neutrality acts, which banned the selling of arms to belligerents, uh, that that was why that the neutrality act is say the neutrality the acts were saying that we don't want war profiteering dragging us into World War II, um, into this European war, as the majority of Americans saw it at the time. So yes, I will be going over some things. We'll make sure we hit the Jeffersonian era, Jackson, uh, you know, the Civil War and Reconstruction. So those things will be incorporated into Corona class broadcast. So keep that in mind. I'm going to be populating it. I'm going to be here at one o'clock. Tuesdays and Thursdays from now until the exam. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you all so much for tuning in. And it is always a pleasure.